indeed. Uh, thank you for this invitation and um, uh, to LTAN and also to the ambassador, Mr. Overland Anderson, um, for um, the EEA funding that makes this meeting possible and our report possible. Um, let me just say uh, by way of introduction that, uh, as uh, other speakers have said, this is just the beginning, uh, so we're not presenting any conclusions yet. So I thought what I should do is present a general legal framework um, that will apply uh, to anything that, that may, may happen. Let me say that I approach this uh, not as an academic, which is my perhaps um, uh, um, the identity that I'm perhaps known for as a, as a professor of public law, but I'm also a practicing barrister in Francis Taylor Building in London. This is our building there. And uh, I have experience, and indeed, uh, James has a great deal of experience in large development projects and they're very complicated projects where there are many different phases of land uh, assembling and uh, compulsory purchase, the various kinds of permitting, environmental impact assessment. And that experience, I think, is very, very useful to what we're talking about now. I mean, the projects we do are mostly, uh, you know, shopping centers, redevelopment, regeneration, you know, of urban sites uh, and so on. Uh, but the sea is not that different in terms of the various interests that conflict and intera interact and interlock. So that's the sort of uh, angle that I approach this. Let me say also that the experience we have abroad, the European experience, will be extremely useful for Greece. Um, I've borrowed uh, from Win Europe's website a map of existing offshore wind farms, and these are uh, mostly uh, fixed bottom wind farms in uh, relatively shallow waters. And you'll see all of them are in the North Sea or by the coast of uh, Great Britain, Scotland, uh, England. Uh, Belgium, Germany, Denmark, you'll see this is where the action is at the moment. There's, there's a great deal of experience there. And indeed, in England and Scotland, there's a, there's, a, there's a great deal of experience about how to do this and how to do it successfully and how to lower prices for the consumer. So the system has worked for these, for, I mean, as far as I know, Scotland and England. Uh, this is a, a map showing uh, floating projects. And there are in, in various degrees of uh, piloting demonstration. Um, and uh, online, as you can see, there are only two, one in Scotland, one in Portugal, and two different technologies. Uh, let me just also add here that the original te flooding technology and the technology of, of Equinor in Norway uh, is based on the oil and gas experience, these mass platforms in the North Sea. But the technology elsewhere, for example, in Portugal, is actually as I understand it, I'm not an engineer, but uh, the way I look at it is actually smaller scale. It doesn't require the huge uh, assembly of vast uh, 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 towers. It seems to be slightly different, the semi-submersible thing. Globally. So uh, these pilot projects are very significant because they're quite different. They have different uh, solutions and there's a great deal of innovation happening. Uh, and indeed, it's happening out of the peak. Um, so I think we can learn a lot from that. So in terms of the legal framework, I, I don't want to go into technical details. I know that this audience is not lawyers. So I'm just going to give an introduction about four uh, points that I think are very significant as we approach this. Uh, the climate law background, so the, the binding targets that all member states are facing, and Greece is also uh, uh, working on that, and I'll, I'll explain how this works, because it, it's relatively novel, these, these constraints. Uh, in a way, we are under a, a kind of climate memorandum, if, I, if I'm allowed, if I'm permitted this uh, kind of joke about pneumonia, we have a kind of pneumonia for climate change, a good one, uh, I, I must add, uh, unconditionally good one. So there are binding targets. There is also an environmental planning framework, including the uh, uh, maritime special plans that Angelo Sirigos mentioned, and I'll, I'll, I'll say something about those. Third, the competition and support framework is very significant, obviously. Um, and finally, something that people mentioned, the pilot uh, projects or pre-commercial, and I will highlight how these are legally different in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that I think is quite interesting and useful uh, for Greece. So let me start with the binding climate targets where um, the Greek government uh, is working under. And I, I need to insist here that these are not uh, um, merely declarations of intent. They're not merely policies or soft law. Uh, progressively, they have become, I think, hard law, which potentially may be 
uh, enforceable by the, before the Court of Justice. I mean, there was a challenge uh, uh, of the recent reforms before the Court of Justice a year ago, and that challenge failed because the applicants didn't have standing. I don't think this, we should take that as a guide. This was a very particular uh, application of citizens against the EU, and that's always very hard to, uh, to do before the Court of Justice. The most likely legal enforcement will come from the Commission against the member states if they fail to meet the targets. Um, but of course, that, that is only the ultimate uh, uh, enforcement. Obviously, there'll be a lot of political pressure in various stages. And as you will see, uh, and indeed, if you read the, the legislation, it becomes very clear, the Commission has uh, uh, very many different avenues uh, with which to put pressure on, on governments and to help the governments and assist them to do this well. Um, so basically, the, the, the big turning point, obviously, is the Paris Agreement 2015, um, where uh, we have the, the nationally determined contributions. This means that the states themselves are responsible for putting forward their own commitments. And indeed, they're going to do, they, they do it every five years and they're about to do it again next year because of the postponement. Um, and something like that is now happening in uh, the European Union. The original Renewables Directive under 2009, it introduced individual national targets. And the aim was to uh, fulfill at least 20% of total energy needs in the European Union with renewable energy. Now, the, that was 2009. This directive has now been recast. Um, and the new target is 32% for the whole of the EU. Um, uh, with obviously a clause for possible upwards revision by 2023. That adds another dimension of the flexibility of the system. But uh, the, 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 there are no strict individual targets through the directive. But so some people say, well, is this a softer system? States have more discretion. That's actually not the case uh, because this directive now has to be read alongside the governance regulation of 2018. That for me is very significant. Lawyers will understand this significance immediately because directives give states an element of discretion. Regulations do not. Regulations apply as if they are domestic laws, domestic statutes. So there's no discretion on governments. They are directly effective, unconditionally. So this governance regulation is very likely to come before the Court of Justice sooner or later. Uh, and that regulation provides, and I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with that, the national energy and climate plans that every government has to submit, uh, covering a 10 year period from 2021 and 2030. I'm sure people know that the election last year meant that the new government after July, the tax government submitted the revised uh, the national energy and climate plan, the NECP for Greece uh, in, in December. And it sets out certain commitments. And now these are still under review. The Commission uh, will uh, uh, express its opinion about all of the plans for all member states, I think later this month. Um, but they are binding in a way that, uh, I mean, it's complicated and it's legally subtle, but uh, at the end of the day, um, they bind the EU and the states themselves. There's a collective target again, 32% of energy from renewables by 2030 and Article 5. And remember, this is a regulation so that's directly applicable uh, in all member states. And that regulation obviously has many different uh, commission powers. There's a great deal of technicality. But as I was reading it this morning, I just, uh, my eye uh, actually focused on this Article 32, Paragraph 6, which shows that it's quite vague, but it, interestingly, allowing the commission to propose measures and exercise its power at union level. I have, I mean, nobody knows what this means really, but the commission can bring actions against member states for failing to fulfill the obligations under that regulation. And I think under the national energy and climate plan. So if you fail to uh, comply or try to comply, there will be legal enforcement through the court of justice. That's how I read it. It's not entirely crystal clear, but I think, uh, there is an intention, clear intention in all documents to create a binding target. So in, in that, if you put that in your background as a, as a sort of the legal background, you see here from table nine from the Greek NECP of December 2019, that wind farms target, um, uh, I think it's uh, 3.6 gigawatt capacity in 2020, needs to become seven 
gigawatt by 2030. It need, uh, I mean, it, it, it needs to double effectively, and that's legally binding. So uh, the Greek government, the Greek policy, uh, public policy needs to find sites uh, to double our capacity uh, in wind farms. It, it's, it's a massive transformation in, in, in nine, 10 years. And that's a legally binding target. And the, the Greek government will always find the European Commission assisting, advising, but also putting pressure on the government to achieve that target. It's not optional anymore. Um, and I think people do not perhaps appreciate how the legal framework has changed. And as if this wasn't enough, which is the existing law, we also have the uh, European uh, Green, De uh, Green Deal, the new De Green Deal, which brings with it a new climate law. Very interesting terminology. We, we say regulation or directive. This one is called climate law. Uh, it is a regulation um, uh, which is now uh, under discussion and it's been proposed and in all likelihood it will pass. I mean, the European Council has given the green light a few months ago. Uh, and that introduces an obligation for net zero uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And there, that regulation, the new climate law, gives even more powers uh, to, to the Commission and updates the targets. So um, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, the Commission will be enforcing this um, uh, very seriously and, in my view, very effectively in the years to come. So that, that's the background. So the, 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 the targets are, I think, inescapable. I think obviously there may be policy reasons or economic reasons that a member state may fall behind, but there will always be that pressure from the, the, the legal framework is now has now changed and is about to change to become even more strict. My second point is the general planning framework. Um, uh, this is a picture uh, from a uh, from the pilot um, uh, project in Portugal, uh, Wind Atlantic, something like that is called. And here, as Angelo Siligo said, the big illegal uh, uh, issue here is the maritime spatial planning. And there's a directive uh, which requires member states to provide plans for the sea by 31st of March 2021. Um, and there are, I mean, this again is a directive, so member states have a, a great deal of discretion, but they have taken account certain minimal requirements. I've just focused on three, there are many others in Article 6, because I think they may generate legal challenges so that if, if, if there is a plan and it doesn't meet those minimum requirements, there might be a challenge by uh, NGOs or from stakeholders, from businesses. And that is one of them is to take into account environmental, economic and social aspects. So to do that adequately, I suppose, and rationally. And ensure the involvement of stakeholders. There is a particular Article 9 about consultation. I'll come to that. I think, uh, I mean, it was um, hinted at earlier. Consultation for me is, is, is incredibly important. And in, in, in the Greek model, as I've seen it, I think it normally involves one stage of consultation at the end. Uh, some of the plans I'll show you about Scotland and England, they, they involve three stages of multi many months of consultation, at three different stages, very early on, middle and end. Uh, for the maritime spatial plan. So, and that that uh, uh, is, is crucial to to gain trust and legitimacy. And, and I must say, we, we must we must ask ourselves why in the Greek case today, I mean, it's not it's not maritime, uh, it's not offshore wind farms, but all these wind farms on the islands uh, have people say, I didn't know anything about it. Nobody asked us, uh, the local people, about the uh, wind farms. In, I was in Tinos in the summer and. I had very many people say, I didn't know anything about these wind farms. That surprised me because there's a, an obligation of consultation and it's very good practice to have very wide consultation. LATN is doing it, I'm very pleased to hear that. So that people who disagree with the outcome know that they have been heard and that the views have been taken into account. That's hugely significant in my view for the success you know, of all these projects. Um, obviously organize the use of the best available data. That's legally, it's, it's a trap because is a, is a court to decide, now it's a legal obligation, what are the best available data? Anyway, I'll just flag it here. I think this might be, this is like kind of invitation for legal challenge uh, for any uh, future uh, court cases. And the activities that the maritime special plans have the full menu, I've just uh, included this from Article 8, you see fish farms, uh, fishing habitats for fish, uh, and of course, energy installations and all the other things, cables, submarine cables, tourism, under, underwater cultural heritage. And this is obviously very complicated. You require various scientific uh, uh, studies for each one of them. 
to allocate, to, to, to understand how each area works, especially issues of conservation. And in many cases in the AGN, we don't have the information. Um, Angelos Tirigos hinted that, we, Angelos and I are old friends, we talk about this a lot. And for me, the, the issue of the Aegean is not one of strategy and defense, but primarily is one of environmental stewardship. Greece needs to extend its uh, exclusive economic zone and potentially its territorial waters from six to, I don't know, nine, 10, 12, but not, not for strategic purposes, but in order to have jurisdiction over the seas to protect them from overfishing, from shipping accidents, uh, from all, all sorts of dangers that, that exist. And that's why the maritime spatial plan needs to apply, in my view, to the fullest possible extent of the maritime zones of Greece. So Greece has to uh, sort out its maritime zones, even on a provisional, the UN, the law of the sea provides that, a provisional uh, uh, delimit, or not, it's not delimitation, but a provisional statement of the outer limits of the claimed uh, exclusive economic zone. Seems to me this has to happen if, if those maritime spatial plans cover the whole relevant area where uh, the offshore wind farms can be located. If you do it only for the six miles, uh, which is the territorial waters of Greece, for me, that, that's, that's a big, that would be a, a huge mistake because this plan is supposed to, to, to last for at least 10 years and you're basically giving up a huge area of potential growth. Remember, these, the, 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 farm, the wind farms we're talking about now are massive. They require, I mean, obviously it's a very small amount of sea, right? it's huge, but you do need to go potentially outside the six uh, 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 nautical miles of the territorial waters. Um, I have uh, relied a little bit on the example of England. Um, remember, the United yeah. Kingdom has one framework and then has England and Scotland separate frameworks. And the English model, which predates the directive, and in some respects is a model for the directive, uh, it's happened, you know, much earlier than anywhere else. Uh, oh, well, maybe Germany had something similar, I suppose. There, is, uh, there are two levels. There is the marine poli policy statement, which is this strategic document about general environmental aims, and then 11 so sort of regional plans uh, in England. And in England, the uh, body responsible is not the department itself, but a special organization, an independent body, uh, in Greek, I'll say an exarchy of the archi, because there are thousands of them in, in England and, and uh, they work very well. It's the Marine Management Organization, which also gives the licenses, the planning permissions for offshore wind farms up to a certain point. After that, it goes to the National Commission. Um, and I just briefly, I, I just wanted to show you these maps very, very quickly. I, I, I mean, it's, it's just, I don't want to waste your time, but this is the an area we all know very well. It's London and Dover. So this is the part of the southeastern England draft plan issued in January. Uh, and you can see, for example, in this map, see how these maps help you understand uh, and plan and also make this legitimate to the public because the public can understand that. They look at this and they say, okay, I, I see what's going on. So this map shows the subsea cables in that area. Um, there's the Thames Estuary. And then at, at the southern end, you see Dover, which is a very busy shipping line. And you see it in other maps. This is potentially where future wind farms may be constructed. That's a sort of uh, uh, um, allocated provisionally there, you can see. Uh, obviously, you protect the shipping line, so you, don't, you go in the middle of, of, of that. And this is another very important, especially for Greece and for its very beautiful and important countryside and the islands and other areas, that these are the designated, the protected landscapes within the um, English planning system. So there are areas of outstanding natural beauty in green, uh, World Heritage Sites in uh, um, uh, Burgundy, I think it is. And then you see the national parks. There's a special legislation for national parks. Um, uh, actually, I can't see any there, but anyway, it's... it's uh, so if you understand where the protected areas are, and then in another uh, figure another table later another map you see the visual impact and you have here two different this is actually two different um, charts one is the visual impact in the sea so areas in the sea that are visible from the land you see the various colors um, and then you can see uh, in on the land map uh, views towards the sea so by looking at that map you understand it's very uh, uh, easy to understand 
where you sh where, where is that where, where you should put something where it's most visible or how far you should go to make sure that it's not visible. Uh, and this is all it's not based it's not based on conjecture. This is based on very accurate measurements that professionals do regularly and and update. And this happens, by the way, also for important sites um, in England. For example, I'm now in the, in the center of Oxford. There is a similar map for Oxford about the landscapes. What, what, what you need to protect to have the various beautiful architectural landmarks protected uh, from various things. Uh, anyway, so these maps, as you can see, are, are very useful. This for, for Greece is actually quite significant. This is the historic environment, and these are maps of shipwrecks. See how many there are in, in London in that area, and presumably. You don't want to build there unless unless you have to. There's had protection there, and that you can see a map with all of them. So that's what the plans do. They integrate all this information and make policy making transparent, effective, um, and, and clear. Um, now, is Greece going to be ready? Are we going to have such maritime plans? Well, uh, we adopt the same policy as in as in Britain. There will be a national strategy and regional plans. Uh, there is uh, there are minor amendments proposed at the moment. Uh, um, I think uh, they'll pass easily, but um, I think I think it's unlikely. I mean, maybe uh, Alexander will tell us more about it, but the, I think we 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 won't make it. Remember, it's a directive. It's not the end of the world if we don't make it. We can delay it because uh, everyone knows it's very difficult. But remember that we need strategic environmental assessments, consultations, and so on. So we, it, it will take a long time for for us to be ready. Um, but we, we cannot avoid it. We have to follow these rules. Finally, very quickly, the competition and support schemes. There's a general framework. I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. On the one hand, we have treaty obligations of non-discrimination. So you cannot say, I only want Greek companies. I want, I want Norwegian. We cannot say those things. You have to have non-discrimination in everything you do on the basis of nationality, but also transparency and, and uh, fairness. And uh, also, there's a question mark, uh, which I, I haven't myself found the final answer to, some of these uh, licenses or processes of permitting may fall under the concessions directive. Uh, so it may be subject to public procurement rules. This basically happens when you advertise for something, you don't pay, you don't buy a public, you don't build a, a road, you don't build them yourself, but the income of, of the developer is gonna come from third parties. That's a concession. And that falls under certain conditions under the directive. Uh, it's not a hugely onerous obligation. Uh, and as far as I've seen, no one has said so far that any offshore wind farms fall under this. Uh, but I just flag it as an issue that may arise that we have the concessions co uh, uh, contracts directive uh, now, didn't used to, so it's very new. And what people are mostly familiar with is the support systems, the state aid, and there are guidelines and there are many, many cases of support for renewables uh, uh, the last few years, and they all have a variation, uh, feeding premiums, feeding tariffs, uh, contracts for difference, and the commission always finds them okay. I mean, that, that is not a huge hurdle, but there are constraints as how to organize it and not be seen to be given unfair state aid. And that has been formalized in the Renewables Directive 2018, the Recast Directive. And the directive requires a market-based and market-responsive way. And as, as Charles said, it, uh, the, the contracts for difference is a perfectly good uh, way of doing that. Um, okay. Now, I just want to end by highlighting something that people have already mentioned, the pilot and demonstration projects. And I just want to highlight that the, these are legally special. And it, 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 as I was looking at it the last few days, it seems to me the EU law is highly permissive when it comes to pilot projects uh, and pre-commercial projects. Uh, I've added now a, a point, a bullet point, that the existing environmental framework from 2008, the APE, the, the, the COPLESIO, the, the, the Special Framework for Renewables in Greece, it does actually mention um, offshore wind farms in Article 10, if I remember correctly. It does also mention anchors, so it, it implies that some of these will be floating. So as far as I'm concerned, it seems to me that 2008 is out of date. We know it's very elementary. I mean, there are all sorts of problems with it, but it's lawful and it's there. And I think my preliminary view is I'm, I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise, um, and maybe that's something for the consultation that we are doing inside Eleta N, that the pilot project, because of its smaller scale, could go under the existing framework. So it could happen 
very quickly without waiting for the maritime special plans to be completed. That's my sort of reading of it. And also the non-commercial nature of such a pilot project uh, creates exemptions, which now are explicit. I'll show you where they are uh, from some of the state aid and competition rules. And I was, as I was looking at the Renewables Direct 2018, there's an explicit exemption, in Article 4. Uh, I showed you the support schemes there that they have to be market-based, but immediately after that, it says member states may exempt small-scale installations and demonstration projects from this paragraph without prejudice to the applicable union law on the internal market for electricity. So you cannot do uh, clearly unlawful things, say only Greek people can apply for pilot schemes. That's against the treaty. But a reasonable and open uh, process could be far simpler than what you follow for the larger commercial developments that have the, the great commercial value, where you have to have full competition, tendering, and so on. Uh, and the same applies for state aid for the, um, the support you give to the pilot uh, uh, projects, so small scale installations and demonstration projects from tendering procedures. So the directive has an inbuilt. Uh, um, uh, flexibility, but it's not, it's not, it's not full flexibility. It doesn't mean you do anything you want. You still have to obey the treaty and the various obligations of fairness and transparency. But there is a great deal of flexibility. And my temporary, as I suppose, um, conclusion is that the pilot project can start immediately. I mean, in the sense that you have the uh, the, the the framework for the renewables from 2008. You don't need to have a, a perfectly formed system. It's a different process. The pilot system is different from the large commercial. So you can start developing the, the commercial element uh, in due course. It may take a year or two to set it up fully, but the pilot projects could start very quickly, uh, is my view. And that the great advantage of that is that you may build the supply chain domestically and elsewhere, I suppose, that fits the Greek case. So the Greek ports, uh, Greek cables, Greek towers, uh, or, or, or local, maybe you go further go to Italy, but you can actually build a supply chain that fits the Mediterranean for the pilot project and then move on and expand and it, it may work or it may not work. But, but the pilot project has the, this, uh, this um, flexibility and allows you to try new things and innovate, try something completely new that doesn't require huge scale. So new entrants, you know, uh, uh, from wherever can actually enter this market. So that's my sort of tentative conclusion that as long as you pro provide the environmental impact assessment for the project, and some basic rules about transparency, you can proceed with the, with the, with the pilot project fairly quickly. And that's all I have to say. And uh, thank you very much uh, for listening.